Why isn't gaming fun anymore? Listen, guys, here's the thing. I'm old. I have gray hairs. But there's one that's thing that's been one. in my life since my hair was short and full of color. Mm -hmm. And that's video games. But recently, I've realized oh, look who it that is. I spend a lot more... It's Zach Rar. Wow. Which one is that? Oh, yeah, that's back whenever I, I was doing the New World. I need to start playing New World again. Time consuming this is a great content video. about video games than I do actually oh, it's playing that guy. video games. In fact, in the past couple of years, there's been months at a time where I did not play a single minute of it's video the games. It's the mogul male guy. It most certainly is not because I'm a busy and accomplished adult with a roaring career and social life. Because <laughs> quite the opposite. My life mostly revolves around watching YouTube videos, streams, and shows. But I actively miss playing video games and spending yeah. countless hours immersing myself in creative worlds and game systems. And it seems like I'm the only one with this problem. All of my friends still have the games that they're obsessed with and play all the time. I personally don't enjoy most of those games. Oh my god. Bro, the only thing missing out of this is the Mad Cats logo. Since uh, apparently I'm a boomer that hates games now. Yeah. So what's the deal? Am I growing out of this hobby that I've loved for so long? Or perhaps I'm just jaded from the infestation of corporate greed and its insatiable hunger for infinite growth afflicted upon us at every corner, in every game, with cash shops <laughs> yep. and battle passes, so many battle passes, and coins, and the crystals you have to buy, yep. and the crystals, you don't get the right amount of crystals, yep. and it doesn't make and sense they, for all the items yep. in the shop because they yeah, have a little one. left over because yeah, they want buy. you to spend more money. Yep. Or maybe games are just bad now. <laughs> or is it some other nuanced collection yeah. of reasons that I'm going to spend the rest of this video exploring and talking I, I, about? I think it's a mix of things. Yeah, no, games are definitely just bad now. Oh, we used to have one of these. I still it was have the early on. 90s. One of my earliest, most Bro, vivid... whatever happened to this shit? Like, uh, y'all remember this game? I used to have this shit. This was on Super Nintendo, F-Zero. And then remember that shit whenever it came out on fucking GameCube? Man, I loved F-Zero. F-Zero GX, yeah. This was, it was so fucking fun, man. Whatever happened to this? Like, that's the next, like, uh, the, the next IP. Like, stop making new Forza sports games. Like, I don't give a fuck about how realistic the wheels look. Bro, make a new F-Zero. Vivid memories of video games was the Christmas that I got a Super Nintendo. Ooh. I got this Mickey Mouse game called The Magical Quest, starring Mickey Mouse. I remember just laying down in my living I room had the goof for troop hours, it was amazing. playing on my little CRT TV. Yep. It was like cracked, my tiny little underdeveloped brain, just seeing pixels moving at my command. I was hooked, and that was it. The floodgates were open. Throwing Foot Clan ninjas into the screen and turning oh the time. God. Collecting all the letters and Donkey Kong Donkey Country. Donkey Kong Country, Donkey. yeah. Koopas. In Super Mario World. Solving puzzles with all the cool items and the links oh, to the past. No. That kick-ass intro in Super Metroid. I, I never beat Super out of my Metroid. I gotta beat that. it. This era was peak gaming and would forever solidify me as a Nintendo fanboy. Yep. I, I too am a Nintendo fanboy. It doesn't matter how many Smash Smash tournaments they cancel at the 11th hour for seemingly no reason. I will still simp for Nintendo and get hyped up whenever one of the old guys that, you know, I p made Super Mario World comes on camera. They're like, we got a new game. I'm like, yes! I don't give a fuck. Then, a few years later, the most fateful day of any kid growing up in the mid-90s. The Christmas where I got my... <laughs> It was that sick-ass green one that was bundled with Donkey Kong 64 yeah. and that little ram pack. But now, games were 3D, I got I got Donkey Super Kong, Mario, Mario Zelda, all had an entirely new dimension to explore, yeah. opening up so many gameplay options. But that wasn't all, because you could play with four players. Mario Kart, yeah. Mario Party, Smash Bros. The only game you could do with multiplayer on Super Nintendo, like, really, is like, you know, there's some fighting games, and like, you could do Secret of Mana with like three people if you had like an adapter. The rise of party like games. Maybe a couple of you could sit games. on the couch with your friends, smacking Mario controllers Party at each other's hands, That's the one we did. cheating, ruin friendships. It was great. But party games weren't the only thing that benefited from the four. We used to have this one kid that uh, he would always turn off the the N64 whenever he would lose Mario Party. So we would have to like, whenever we were like, you know, it was like round like 19 out of 20, we would have to be ready to fucking 
just like fucking grab him and like throw him down before he hits the reset button. First slots. Multiplayer first person shooters. My friends and I spent countless hours on GoldenEye 64. We even used to get I cardboard boxes and tape them up to the screen to section it off so that you couldn't screen look. Oh, we took we that shit that. very seriously. Now, by this time, first person shooters already existed on PC, but I had the crappiest Dell that was cheap and out of date even for the late 90s. Do I My mom uh, had a computer in the 70s, okay? I grew up with the best fucking computers. But we didn't have a lot of shit, but she worked from home. She needed to use a computer. What? Yeah. Uh, my, my grandfather uh, was a pilot in World War II, and then after World War II, he became a uh, cartographer. And so uh, my mom, like, w worked with him, and so she was, like, getting a, a computer to do that. So, like, yeah, like, like the old Osborne PCs, like, with the monitor, it's, like, this big and it's green. I have one of those. I was still able to play bangers like Rollercoaster Tycoon, Never Age of Empires 2, Ooh, Starcraft. I, I knew the PC was eventually going to be where it's after me. But for now, the Starcraft next console well. era was upon Starcraft us. Starcraft as well. People sleep on GameCube, but I think pound for pound, it's very hard to beat the GOAT PS2, the greatest console of all time. However, GameCube was fucking incredible. Absolutely amazing. I got a GameCube. That was the first one I got. I remember I got GameCube and Pikmin. I really feel like there was two games in particular that defined this and generation for me mentioned. personally. Yeah. The first game was Smash Bros. There were so many more characters than the first game. So many more stages. Yep. It controlled beautifully. It was a masterpiece. It sure was. One time my parents made us go play outside and so we stuck the TV up against the window and threw the controllers out there and so we were all just standing outside playing Smash Bros through a window. And the second yeah. game was Time Splitters 2. Oh my fucking god. Remember like they had seven different characters that were these girls with massive fucking titties? That's the only thing that I remember about this game. I remember I loved the game so much. It was amazing. Even playing the campaign. Yes. Yes. And um, we played the campaign, and the campaign was really good. And then, like, me and Sean and Dylan and, like, AJ and, like, fucking, like, Cody, Jeff, Lowell, Cameron, Zach, we would all fucking play Time Splitters 2. We did, we did Time Splitters 2 until Halo, uh, like, kind of got big. And not, I mean, it was still big, but like we kind of like swapped over to Halo after playing this. From the same developers of GoldenEye, so Time Stories would become my favorite shooter to this day. Yeah. The game had an insane amount of game modes, yep. tons of characters, a map editor that you make your own yep. story missions. It had it all. One of my friends was a genius when it came to making maps, and every we time we not. got together, he had a couple new maps that had some interesting gimmick that completely changed the way we played the game. One of my favorite we maps of his all. was one where it was just this square. It was like a grid of rooms with doors, and we would run around with one shot, one kill baseball bats. It was terrifying. If you've never played Time Slitters, uh, I'm sorry, you, you're you really missing out. I'm not sure how well this game holds up to time, but I remember this game was really, really fun to play back in the day. I loved it. The era of couch gaming would not last forever though. And in it fact, wasn't. it was uh, soon coming know. to a close. Monday, March 15th, 2004. Oh boy. Ah, uh, yeah. 2004 was a golden year for gaming. This was the day that I created my first RuneScape account. Oh boy. It would be my first introduction into the world of MMOs, the genre that encapsulated everything that I loved about gaming. The adventure, the immersion, puzzle solving, crafting, and I could play and enjoy it with my friends and hundreds of people across the world. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was loving every minute of it. Later that year, a certain I never other went hard as fuck on RuneScape. I really wish I did. Their MMO would release World, World of Warcraft. Yeah. Unfortunately, there was one issue. I still had dial-up internet. Again, man, I remember my dad. My dad retired in 2003. And I was like, Dad, you're going to need a really good computer. 
you want to be able to work on a computer, you got to make sure you get one of those really good computers. You've got to make sure that the computer is really good. Uh, that way it can run Microsoft Word and more importantly, War Warcraft 3 Frozen Throne online flawlessly. And uh, it's, yep. <laughs> yep. Well, I remember he spent like two grand on that computer. And to be fair, it was a really good computer. It lasted for like fucking like 10, 15 years. It would be a few years until I got out of dial-up hell. Yeah. So in the meantime, the only way I could play World of yeah, Warcraft Broadband. was either by playing at friends' house or sneaking the installation out of the school computers in the library, which I absolutely did. They were not very well managed at the time. I wouldn't hit max level on World of Warcraft until the tail end of Burning Crusade just Ooh. before Wrath. But by then, World of Warcraft was the game that I it played. Was. And it would remain that Big. way for several years, until about halfway through my senior year of high school. That's when I got beta access to StarCraft II Wings of Liberty. Mm. My friends and I were so hyped for this game, we spent every day in school in our computer class just playing StarCraft II. I fell in love with competitive gaming and esports because of StarCraft 2. I feel like StarCraft 2, maybe this is like a bad take and it's just like my opinion, but like I feel like StarCraft 2 was the first game that really brought esports into the mainstream. Like Counter-Strike was always there, but StarCraft 2 had like a meteoric rise of like awareness and people that were just like fixating on it and playing it all over the place it was like a it was the first game that was culturally relevant as an esport like unreal tournament quake these were all esports before but it was the first culturally relevant esport to gaming as a whole and like that people would know about from from my viewpoint the first game that i actually tried to play competitively and work my way up a rank ladder I would practice almost every day with friends, Damn. watch Day 9 and Husky videos, aspirations of going pro. Him. I only ever made it to plat, but getting to plat felt incredible. I remember my friend remember and I used Destiny? to wake up at like 5 in the morning to watch the yeah, GSL. Remember him? And in 2011, as a broke college student in Orlando, Florida, I bought a ticket to MLG using a literal bag of coins. But it was such an incredible experience. My friends and I got to meet all of our favorite players, Huck, in control. There he is! <laughs> There we go, right there. We also got to meet Day9, Husky, Artosis, oh, and Tasteless. Shit. It would be my very first, yep. and unfortunately, my very last live gaming event. And eventually, StarCraft II would give way to League of Legends, yep. which a few years later gave way to Smite, which would be the last competitive esport game that I played seriously. No wonder he quit. None of them really grabbed me in the same way that StarCraft II did, and I'm not sure any other competitive esport ever will. I think it's because, like, StarCraft 2 also, like, the game had so much massive hype, and then also it was so, like, everybody was playing StarCraft 2. It was cool to play StarCraft 2. Personally, I think that's a big reason. This was about the peak of gaming in my life. Yeah. The best of it all came before, and I feel like I can pinpoint the exact year that the steep slope downward began. 2013. And that year was 2014. Close enough. This was the year that Star... To keep in mind, that was the year that Warlords of Draenor came out. Craft was all but dead. The year yeah. Warlords of Draenor came out, the first ever World of Warcraft <laughs> expansion that I did not buy or play. Yeah. This was the year Destiny released and was a massive disappointment. This was the year that Smite introduced loot boxes. Ooh. This was the year that Wildstar released and failed. And every year on from this point just seemed to be one big disappointment after another. Yeah. It felt more and more common for games to release unfinished or broken or have some predatory monetization. Every year seemed worse than the last. Gaming seems different now. I feel it's because, like, every game back then was, like, uh, you know, like, not every single one was meant to be played online. As soon as every game was, like, meant to be played online, the developers didn't care about shipping a finished product because they could patch it. Have games changed? I think the game that absolutely games have changed in terms of being online-focused. Like, many of the big games now are online service, live service games. Like, League of... Like, let's let's look right now. Uh, I, th I think this would be interesting. I'm, I'm not even sure what this is going to show. Uh, Twitch.television. 
Let's see what the biggest and most popular gaming categories are right now. Okay, uh, live service, live service, live service, live service, live service, live service. Is GTA live service? I don't know. Tarkov live service, FIFA half and half, Minecraft half and half, I'd say. Fortnite. Oh, did yeah, it is? Yeah, is Counter Strike live service? I don't know. Like, Fortnite definitely live service, Dragonflight live service, Genshin live service, live service, live service, live service, live service. Uh, I don't know about these. And, and so anyway, you can see how almost every popular game, and this is only on Twitch, it's not a, you know, big, it's not the only way to look at it, but let's look at, uh, you know, Steam Database, for example. Live service, live service, live service, live service. What the fuck is this? Uh, live service, uh, live service, live service, live service. They're, they're pretty much all live service games. Except for Elden Ring. Which is also still getting updates, but it's not really a live service game in the same way. The industry has grown incredibly fast since I first picked up a controller. In fact, in 2021, the games industry raked in more cash than music and film combined. A good bit of this growth can be attributed to the rise of mobile gaming, which in 2021 made up 45% of the total revenue in the industry. And of course, the stench of this heaping pile of cash would not go unnoticed by the insectoid swarm of C-suite executives. And yep. with their grubby little shit-stained appendages and their dungus touch, they've pushed hard to make console and PC gaming monetization more closely resemble that of a mobile game, attempting to normalize all the same underhanded tactics which apply psychological manipulation in various ways to pry as much money as they can out of its users in a predatory- well, The problem also is like, I mean, you can talk about how bad it is, but people keep playing the games. At the end of the day, everybody keeps playing them. And it's like Overwatch 2 comes out, people still play Overwatch 2. Not always. Yeah, the reason why people don't play a game is if it's bad. It's not because it's monetized in an in a unfair way. It's because it's a bad fucking game. Whether it's feeding off of players' addictions by implementing gambling adjacent mechanics, or their frustration by adjacent. creating problems and selling back the solutions, or FOMO with limited Let's time option by creating problems and selling back the solutions, yep. or FOMO with limited time buy now expensive skins, the online nature of the live service. I'm going to be honest, I don't really care about how skins are monetized as long as they're not loot boxes. I don't care if they sell skins for a thousand dollars, it doesn't matter to me at all. But I fucking hate whenever the, the game is programmed and designed to have 100 bag spaces, but they only give you 50, and you have to buy, you know, five bag space upgrades, and each one costs more than the last one, Lost Ark. ...has primed games for these sort of exploitations. POE? It's not complete. Yeah, but the thing is, PoE is fucking free, and for the price of a AAA game... You can get everything in PoE that you want. Everything that you will ever need, you can get for the price of a AAA game, and it's a one-time purchase. Like, PoE, yes, they have, they do have loot boxes. L for PoE, absolutely. However, I, I'm, I'm still going to say, like, I, I love PoE, and uh, I, I don't think that they should be lumped in with this at all without its pushback though as we gamers have been successful in combating some of these changes as is the case with loot boxes as we pretty much eradicated those from most pc and console games at this point though it definitely seems like a losing battle as every year more yeah. ground gives way to the normalization of such strategies in like a one step forward ten step back kind of way for example if we look back it wasn't that long ago when dlc was considered outrageous it was seen as devs taking content out of the original game and holding it back to sell later yeah, but as always that. the ground gave way and the conversation shifted to whether or not it was day one DLC or how much effort they put into the DLC. If the well, the problem is that consumers, and this is what I've said before, it is so rare that once an industry gets large enough that consumers can have any sort of concerted effort against like any sort of like product trend. So like, for example, with like... Uh, like sports or with like buying shoes or something like that the the market is so vast and large that's the same thing but it's so vast that 
there's never going to be a point where you can get enough people together to make a change because there's always going to be a bunch of other people out there who are thinking to themselves, you know what? It's totally fucking fine. I don't care. D&D, though? Yeah. And that's why it didn't work with Magic is because Magic is a much smaller community. And so it was easier to get people to like kind of push back against like the magic thing or the D and D thing, because the community is a lot smaller. It's a lot more close knit and uh, it's harder to, to fucking, you, you can't rely on having this massive silent majority of people that don't even know, you know, well, where's the BlizzCons been? Well, I thought this quest had a different name. Didn't he, didn't that character, well, whatever happened to that one character, uh, like, I don't remember what the fuck his name was, like, that, uh, that guy in Strathlon, the, uh, fuck, I forgot, oh, uh, whatever, yeah, they got no idea, where's McCree, well, yeah, well, we had a new name, well, I like McCree, what the fuck, okay, and that's it, that's literally it, they never, that, 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 that it's that, that minimal for them. Content was worth it, fast forward to today, where similar kind okay, <laughs> Holy shit! Look at this. Well, what did he do? Did he search Asmongold, pay to win, Tower of Fantasy, free player defends Diablo Immortal? Bro, I think we already were gonna watch that. Didn't Mizkif get banned for watching that? The cuckold experience video? Diablo Immortal, Asmongold reacts to real pay to win, Diablo 4. Conversations are being had about the pay to win debate, where at first any pay to win is completely unacceptable, to now being able to find conversations about how a certain game is not that pay to win. Yeah. But complaining about monetization in games is nothing new or original. In fact, it's an oversaturated market, and at this point, it just feels like beating a dead horse. It seems you'll never get enough people to care about this topic, and until that happens, That's problem. nothing will change. True. Instead, I'd like to talk about a bit of a hot take here that in the past 10 years, Gaming really hasn't changed. I don't understand how they are able to get away with this. How is it that they can keep releasing it? How, how? It's a good game. It's been 10 years, man. They've done more remakes of Skyrim in 10 years then I bet Nintendo has done of Super Mario Brothers in 40. Changed much at all. The gaming industry feels pretty stagnant. Oh. If I compare games as they are now to how I thought they would be by now as a kid, the picture is very disappointing. As a kid who just discovered MMOs like RuneScape and World of Warcraft, I was blown away by the idea of what MMOs could be in the future. Yeah. I would hop off World of Warcraft and go play Dungeons & Dragons and think, man, one day World of Warcraft is going to have the same level of choice and consequence that I can have with my imagination playing D&D. Now obviously, that hasn't happened yet, and as a kid, I didn't know anything about game development. But I've heard a similar observation from Rasboon in his video series, Gaming for a Non-Gamer, which is great. Oh, I might watch that. That's really interesting. That's serious. Cool. And I recommend you check it out. Where he discusses his wife's disappointment discovering video games for the first time. Yeah. Her expectations for what she thought she could do in each game were always different than the reality. And I think as she realized that games were more simple than she had first assumed, some of the intrigue about them faded. There's a massive lack of innovation. Oh, I think that's also one of the reasons why people feel like the magic has gone away from gaming is that back whenever you were a little kid, it was harder to find out where those limits were because you were just stupid. But now that you know like very much and very defined, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, this is how you can do it, this is how you can't do it, you know, and it's like back, yeah, there's no internet. Remember back in like classic WoW, there were a lot of people that thought that you could get Ashbringer by fishing. And like, there were so many people doing it that like Blizzard had to come out with like a statement and be like, guys, this is just some bullshit. Like, it's not real. Like, st stop fishing under the bridge. It, it, you're not going to get the, the sword. It's not going to happen. Stop. And, and risk taking in the AAA space. Yeah. As we it, see games like Skyrim being released a billion times, The okay. Last of Us is getting its third version I'm of the game. I'm going to play this. Call of Duty ran out of ideas and decided to just loop back around and start re releasing. I don't know how they can do Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 for the third time. Is that Call of Duty Modern Warfare 5 or is it times like 
times three, so it's Call of Duty Modern Warfare 6. It's kind of, yeah, Modern Warfare 2, 2. <laughs> their games in order again hoping nobody would notice but they somehow made all the games worse so everyone noticed which brings me to my next point where not only are companies not really interested in innovating at all but they seem to be actively taking step backwards in innovation if you look at something like the original fallout's super in-depth dialogue system versus fallout 4's dialogue system it's a huge step back and that's a tame example it gets so that. much worse Blizzard, for uh -oh. example, figured out that they can retroactively ruin a 20-year-old game with Warcraft 3 Reforged. Well, I guess that was pretty innovative. The only real innovations coming out of this industry are coming from indie developers and modders, the latter of which is responsible yeah. for the two biggest genres in the past decade, and that's without even the expectation. That's a really good insight. I've never heard somebody say that, but that's so fucking true. MOBAs and also BRs were mods. Yeah, game companies... <laughs> yeah, they haven't fucking done anything. I know, yeah, what the fuck, man? That is... sad. Getting paid. Isn't that weird? Kind of goes against the conventional capitalist thinking, huh? Looking at the trajectory of the industry, it's really hard to not just be depressed about it all and wonder if the industry can ever course correct. I think it already is. Like, you're already seeing course correction inside of the industry. But the problem is that course correction doesn't mean everybody is going to do the same thing that you want them to do. Course correction, in my mind, means that there's a space for you if you don't want to play a game with seven different Battle Pass tiers. It's weird to think that things like YouTube, Reddit, and all these other social media sites haven't really been around that long. And yet it's sometimes hard to remember what it was like before they existed. These sites have made data mining, crowdsourced information, and video guides all accessible to everyone at all times. In some cases, the internet will have every bit of information about every mechanic and secret in a given game before they even release. And all of these things have drastically changed how we play video games. Let's take a look at a game like World of Warcraft. Ooh. If I had to describe how I feel playing Retail WoW in one word, it would be emptiness. Not because of a lack of content necessarily, so much as the game just kind of feels soulless. Where before, the game was about adventure and discovery, it is instead now a game about optimization. Wow, look at that. That's the, uh, that's the average World of Warcraft raider. There you go, guys. It's essentially a solved game where add-ons and logs have optimized gameplay to a T with little room for experimentation or creativity. Which is fine. I mean, no one likes to play sub-optimally. I'm not trying to vilify optimization, as it can be quite fun for some people. Take speedrunning, for example. Yeah. Speedrunning is such an interesting hobby to me. It's something I've always wanted to get into, but I've always felt a little intimidated by. The stuff that people are able to achieve with speedrunning is truly mind-blowing. Some of which is only really possible because of the interconnected nature of modern gaming, where sharing glitches and exploits is part of the fun of collectively iterating on runs to shave off more and more time. But then it's it probably true that speedrunning is the uh, is like a cool thing that online gaming has really like kind of acted as a force multiplier for. So yeah, I am very much like if you had to, if I had to fall on one side of the fence or another. I am very happy with how gaming is now, overall. Like, I would not want to go back to the way it used to be. If you look at something like RuneScape, one of the most solved games that has become literally all about the optimization, you'll find a community who's made it a tradition of coming up with off-the-wall challenges and restrictions inflicted upon their accounts, yeah. also known as Dark Snowflake Souls is accounts, really like that too. so that they are forced to forge their own path. There's no guide to follow on how to clear one of the hardest raids in old school RuneScape if you're not allowed to leave the swamp zone. But one man, after three years of theory crafting, grinding, and 33 very entertaining YouTube videos, was able to accomplish that goal, with hundreds and thousands of people watching and loving it. Oh my god. So clearly, the problem for World of Warcraft isn't just that. optimization itself. Well, I remember like a good example of that in WoW is my Iron Man series. I remember I did like this Iron Man series where I would level all the way through the game in all white gear and I couldn't die. 
And there were a few times where like I went to like three health or something like that. It was so crazy. I eventually fucked up and died, but it was a great series. I think that really like having those different types of like uh, challenges and stuff like that, like so level one runs. Um, let's think of some other ones. Like, uh, you know, Elden Ring has a million of those types of challenges. Uh, WoW has the Iron Man challenge. I, I think RuneScape has a million of these things, too. Uh, I, I don't even know. Lasso, Halo. Yeah, that's another good example. Like, remember that whenever uh, Dravalin, uh beat the, uh, the Moist Critical fucking Lasso Halo challenge? That was so fucking hype, man. That was amazing. It's that optimization isn't just confined so to the few who enjoy yeah, it, but go. instead sort of forced onto everyone else. With all these tools available to everyone and things like Raider.io assigning public completion scores, everyone is expected to be fully optimized or not play the game. Yeah. Because again, no one likes to play suboptimally. Ignorance truly is bliss. Well, there are people that like to play suboptimally. They play for fun. That's fine. The difference is that nobody will want to play with them. It's my opinion that this is the real reason why World of Warcraft has been struggling. Like Asmongold has said, Blizzard has ignored the casual audience and failed to produce fun and compelling activities that aren't just about the optimization. I think that Dragonflight has gone against that. I actually think Dragonflight has been a very, very big departure from that in a big way. Obviously, it doesn't mean WoW saved. However, it has been a, a, a tremendous improvement. Instead, they just continue to double down on the raids oh, and dungeons, yeah, catering to this nature of gameplay. Now, as of this recording, Dragonflight has not released yet, so maybe that will be the expansion that fixes this issue. But it's not just... It did not fix the issue, but it substantially improved it. Retail. A lot of players were excited about Classic and logged in expecting to recapture that nostalgic sense of adventure. But things are too different now. The way we play games is too different now. Yeah. The game didn't seem nearly as hard as they remembered. Can never the world, none of that. But I think it comes down to the fact that every facet of the game has been solved already, and that the joy of the original release lied in the discovery and the journey. Now, this is not everyone's opinion. There's still plenty of people that very much enjoyed Classic. Mm -hmm. This is mostly just anecdotal sentiment from me and my friends. But I do think that this might be why so many people get excited yeah. whenever a new MMO is released. It's a chance. Everybody loves new MMOs because it's a reset. It's a reset where everybody starts on an even playing field and you're part of a shared adventure. And that's what people are really looking for. It's to discover things for the first time, yeah. to not be beholden to the methods and builds that someone else already figured out. And every To be fair, the first fucking day of New World, uh, the beta, we already figured out the hatchet was the best weapon. Uh, we got max level by farming the invasions, or sorry, corruption portals in Shattered Mountain. We were level 60 in the beta in like three days. And then at that point, we farmed the dungeons. We figured out the whole watermark system. And then we were complaining about how bad the game was. And we had a bunch of fucking gamer dads that were downvoting us saying that like, oh, you just, you, you, you're so dumb. I I'm fishing and I'm having fun and I said shut up old man you don't know anything and uh, you know what happened happened same rant yes what a surprise I'm duping my rant about new world fuck you it didn't have to be like that everyone is expected to use a chance for you to be the one that discovers those methods but for better or for worse yep. this is just the way the world is now Maybe someday a game will come out that is it. Remember back when. <laughs> Do you remember that fucking time? <laughs> that whenever Dragonflight came out, me and McConnell were like killing that rare. And then we finally killed it and it didn't drop any loot. And then we're like, wait, it might be a bug. And then we kill it again. It doesn't drop any loot again. And then everybody fucking runs away. They're like, scatter, run away before Blizzard gets us. Get away, quick. Everybody's like flying on their mounts and get on dragon fighting, trying to get away to where they don't get banned. It was the funniest fucking thing, man. And that's why it's fun to play new content like that is because you have times like that when it happens. That's why the Rex Troy videos are so fun is because it pushes the boundaries of what's to be expected in a game. Immune to this phenomenon. 
a game that can't be solved, where the discovery never goes away. It doesn't seem possible. I but... think it is. I think that we might actually have a game some point in the future that is created through AI and it exists infinitely and it is constantly changing in a way that is not understandable. Yeah, there's a procedural generated AI video game that comes out 27 years from now. And the content is so expansive that no human being can ever complete all of it faster than it can be generated. Who knows? Maybe someday. That'd be good. I actually thought about going and playing this game. No, it's life? Oh. It's real life. Yeah, never mind. I don't feel like a different person. I feel like I always have been and always will be me. But I've changed my mind and opinions on a lot of things in the past 10 years. Growing up and dealing with adult responsibilities can be really stressful. You're yeah. faced with a lot of change and uncertainty, and it can be really easy to succumb to worry and regret. But worry and regret are just a waste of time. Time that could be better spent having fun. You know, people say video games are a waste of time, Fuck, but personally- bro, bro, the people that are like, oh, video games is a waste of time. Wait a minute, I have to get home so I can watch Dancing with the Stars. Like, you spend three hours watching the news about politics. So you can vote for a guy to not do what he said he was going to do. Every two years. Nope. No, you're not going to make me feel bad about that. Uh-uh. I think that having fun and enjoying your life is the best way to spend your time. But what do you do if you no longer enjoy your favorite hobby? With this fog hanging over my head, I began reminiscing on how I used to enjoy games. I used to spend countless hours grinding the ladder in StarCraft 2, working on refining builds, seeing small improvements over time, making quantifiable progress in the skill feels so good. Ugh. I don't think that's something that you're going to get back because you get older and you get that sense of fulfillment from something that means more to you. Like being really good at StarCraft 2 means so much whenever you're 16 and it means so little whenever you're 36. Because at the, at the time that you've been 36, you've probably had multiple real life successes. You have your own, you know, family maybe. You have a career. You have a bunch of things that you have that are external from yourself that can give you a sense of self-worth. But whenever you're a kid, you're a young guy, you are a fucking loser. When you're a 17 year old guy, what is the most impressive thing that you've done? You volunteered for uh, a charity and you threw away garbage for a month during the summer. Okay, nobody cares. And that's why people play, that's especially why young, uh, young guys get attracted to video games because it gives them a sense where they can compete on an even playing field with everybody else and they can win. The dopamine. But today, if you asked me to play just about any competitive game, I could not be fucking bothered. I haven't played League of Legends in like nine years, but I booted it up a couple of months ago. My friends were telling me about all the new champions and the new metas and the new builds and I just wanted to go take a nap. Is it because my attention span is shot? Is it the lack of elasticity in my rotting brain protesting against me trying to shove even more useless shit into it? Maybe both. I used to have the drive to spend hours learning everything I could about a new game. There were times where all I could think about was whatever game I was currently playing. Thinking about what I wanted to accomplish next, how I was going to do it, and I wouldn't stop until I finished. Well, I've always had that as a benchmark too. Where if you're not thinking about a video game at the Taco Bell drive through it's not that good of a game. Nowadays, I'd be lucky to stick with the game for more than a couple weeks before I'm over it, regardless of if I actually finished it or not. So Wait, hey, yo, they had somebody in this game call himself Mr. Hands? That's crazy. How about that? that that's not- wow, what the fuck?
Yeah, okay. All right. It is what it is. I know some people said, I read in the chat, they said, oh, I still feel that way about games, etc. Yeah, of course. But I don't also I also don't think that what I'm saying is made irrelevant just because everybody doesn't have the exact same shared experience. I think in general, whenever you're young, accomplishments in video games mean more because you don't have any other accomplishments or anything else to really have to your name. Whenever you get older, they don't mean as much because you have other things that you've already used to establish your self-worth. This is a trend, not a rule. It's a trend. Then, are there any games that I do enjoy? After Elden so many Ring. disappointing letdowns and trying to enjoy oh, games that just start to annoy me after two weeks, this question legitimately crossed my mind. And at the peak of my jadedness, one game proved to Valheim. me that I did still indeed have the capacity to fall in love with the game. And that game was Valheim. Big a game, game that isn't even finished yet, but a game that's so perfectly created. They're going to finish Valheim? Apparently, uh, Valheim, the, the creators of Valheim had a, uh, they had a uh, fucking, like a meeting with uh, Gabe from Steam and Valve and also Steven from Ashes of Creation. And they figured that they would release Half-Life 3, finish Valheim, and also release Ashes of Creation in the same decade. It's going to be uh, in like, I think 2070 or something like that created a sense of adventure and discovery that it reminded me why I love gaming to begin with. So it seems there may still be remnants of a gamer deep underneath all the jadedness. I've proven to myself that I definitely haven't outgrown the hobby. Maybe I've just been playing the wrong games. And sure, the world is different, and the way we play games is different, mm -hmm. but they're still fun to be had. And despite the industry's best efforts to cannibalize itself, there will always be passionate indie developers and modders to pick up the slack and make good games and experiences. And maybe that's enough. Well, it kind of has to be enough. But I'm determined to rekindle my love of gaming. And that will be my New Year's resolution. I will begin my search to find the fun. That's such a good outlook. I love this outlook. This is great. Try to find things that you like doing rather than continuing to do things that you don't like and getting mad that they're not fun anymore. Actually not a Doomer video. I like this a lot. Did y'all ever have like on the, that's like the original Game Boy, right? Did y'all ever have the, the thing that would take pictures? y'all have that no i didn't i, I didn't either I, I got jealous that like uh, other people had it i didn't yeah the game boy camera uh let me link the video for you guys i'm gonna read some of the comments real quick and uh kind of see what they have to say i had the printer i did not have that i had um like i remember i, I had fuck what was it i had like the little light where like, i could play it at night like under the blanket and shit like that uh, X-Man gaming video, check it out. No, no, I'll watch it. I mean, there's been a lot of conversations about this. It's not a surprise. And, uh, yeah, the light, I had a bunch of that shit, man. It was great. The magnifier? Yeah, I think I had that one, too. The only thing I ever remember about a Game Boy is I remember one time I was in an auditorium and it got dark and I didn't have the light with me. And there was a kid that was a seat down, like a row down, and he had a Game Gear and the screen was lit up, and a Game Gear, let's be honest, was just way fucking better than a basic Game Boy. It was like a thousand times better. It wasn't even close. And I, I felt like the biggest, like, broke bitch that I didn't have that. And I had to sit there and watch that kid play Sonic the Hedgehog for 30 minutes until all six of his AA batteries went ran out, and he had to replace them. And, you know, it only took 30 minutes for that to happen uh, for the Game Gear. And uh, that's about it. But I didn't really know that. I, I was like, wow, I guess you just stopped playing the game because it was so boring being amazing. You know, having one of these things. We're like 20. No, I was six. I have one. And uh, even have TV on Game Gear. I remember PSP was really, uh, was, uh, was, was really big whenever it came out too. Still have it? Yeah, yeah, bro. I have so many of those fucking old things, man. Yeah, I actually collected old game consoles uh, like whenever I was younger. And I have, like, Sega Saturn, Sega Master System, uh, the Odyssey uh, Entertainment System. I think I have an Atari. I have, like, obviously, like, every Nintendo console, every uh, PlayStation console. Uh, I, no, I don't. I don't have uh, PlayStation 3. 
and it was expensive. I have PSP. I had like all, all of this stuff. Who funded this? Well, I did uh, because I would buy them at thrift stores and then try to fix them. Uh, yeah, I have a Dreamcast. Yeah, I had Sega Saturn. I had Sega CD as well. I had actually two versions of Sega CD. I have the Sega CD that would stack on top of the uh, the Sega Genesis, and then I had the one that would stack on it. It was it would be it was on the side of it too. Yeah, Game Boy Color. I had Game Boy Advance. I had Game Boy DS. Sega CD. Oh yeah, GameCube. Oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I had GameCube. The Virtual Boy. I don't think I have one of those. Yeah, I remember I got like controllers for it, but I never actually got one. Did you have a Vectrex? No, I, I don't even really know what that is. I have to like really think back what that was. Advance SP? Oh, the the little like the, the square one where it would flip up. Yeah, I, I did have one of those actually. But yeah, anyway, I think this is a great video. Why isn't gaming fun anymore? I, I think that there are a lot of people that like hyper analyze gaming and they focus on what they don't like about it. And instead of that, they don't ever think about what they do like and what they do enjoy. Because there are games that come out that I think are really fun. Like I'll go through some of my Steam lists and I'll talk about games that I think that are genuinely fun, okay? Um, I think Alt F4 is a genuinely fun, goofy fucking game. Uh, Among Us is a great game. I'm not a fan of it, but obviously other people like it a lot. Uh, I think Balloons is a good game. Cuphead, uh, obviously Dark Souls. I've I've not, I've not played Doom yet. I need to play it, but uh, I hear everything that I hear and see about it is good. Elden Ring. I think Fall Guys is fucking amazing. I love Fall Guys. Uh, let's see, what are the other ones I've won or played? Hades, Hades, incredible fucking game. Hollow Knight, amazing game. I I. There's the map annoyed the fuck out of me, so I quit it last time. Uh, and, and these are all games that like exorbitant microtransactions. I mean, I, I enjoy Lost Ark, but I know a lot of people don't for that same reason. Uh, New World, I like New World. Needy Streamer Overload. Remember, I played this, I thought it was fucking hilarious. And uh, let's see, what are some other good ones here? Sekiro, um, uh, V Rising was great, Valheim, Vampire Survivors. I mean, Witcher 3. Fuck, man. There's so many good games.